Hello everyone, welcome to the second Asia Pacific Rail webinar. Uh, my name is Bestin, I'm part of the Asia Pacific Rail team. Uh, following on our opening session from last week, uh, which covered the impact of COVID-19 on railway operations, we will continue today with a session on restarting high-speed rail operations post-COVID-19. Uh, our presenter today is Andrea Guricin, who is the Global Transport Consultant at TRA Consulting. Uh, before we start the session, we would like to invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A section, which you can find at the bottom or the top of your Zoom interface. Um, now, with that said, I would like to introduce Andrea, who will be uh, starting the session. Andrea? Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, if, and, uh, if you are in Asia or if you are in, in Italy, in Europe. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I... Mm, Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, okay, I have my presentation. I hope that uh, right now I can't. Okay, I will try to to share perfectly. Great. I hope that you can see my presentation. Here we are. So, thank you very much. And today we will start to discuss about the high-speed rail restarting operation post-COVID-19. It's a key issue right now because high-speed rail is a key element for transportation, especially in some country, if you think about China or if you think about Japan or Europe. This is very important because this is a clear element to understand what will be the future for the high-speed rail. Uh, just a short, uh, short brief. Uh, introduction of myself. I work since uh, many years from 2009 with different CEOs of Italo and TV. Italo is the first high speed rail operator. I work as a senior rail consultant at the World Bank. I work a lot in, uh, in Asia, especially in South Korea, for example. I give some lectures as professor uh, in Japan too, and in Japan, Vietnam, um, or uh, and also Thailand, and also I'm former visiting professor until December at the China Academy of Railway Science. So I will try to give you a global, a global perspective. First of all, where we were. So where the, how was the situation before COVID-19? First of all, it's very important to take in mind that high-speed rail lines in the world was growing so fast in the last year. If we take the data of UIC, Union International Chemin de Fer, the International Association of Railways that we saw last week, the director for passenger, Mar Gigon, that give very good presentation here at Asia Pacific Rail, we can see that total kilometers of infrastructure for high-speed rail right now are more than 52,000 kilometers. That is much more the herd circumference. And this is a very strong group from 2017, July 2017 to, to February 20. If we check a uh, single country by country, it's very, very interesting that the high-speed rail lines uh, is the biggest country in the world, of course, is China with more than 35,000 kilometers. Then we have also Spain, Japan, France, Germany, Italy, and South Korea. This is the main country. But to remember that the high-speed rail start to be in many countries. As you know, there's a big project in Thailand. There's a big project that is the three airports connection. There's a big project also, for example, uh, in Indonesia, the Jakarta-Bandung lines, that is uh, China's lead. There's a project in India, but also we have already high-speed rail, for example, in Africa, in Morocco, uh, that they started operation. So it's very interesting how high-speed line is growing or was growing in the last years. This is a very important point to think about the investment for the future. But take in mind that the high-speed line is is a single system in terms of there's a single uh, kind of high-speed line, the same technology or similar technology, but the market is completely different. Let's start from Europe, for example. Europe, as you know, started Italy with the high-speed line uh, operation in open access competition. Italy in 2012 started to have competition. On the same infrastructure, you have two high-speed operators. One is private, the other one is a, a public one. It's a state-owned enterprise. This is very interesting because 
the European Union decide to go in the same direction of Italy, and from December 2020, we will have opening the competition there. Then we have a China, where we, you have a, a big operator, China Airways, and then there's a regional, uh, you know, a, a regional ones, that they are searching to be more and more efficient, because, of course, they invest a lot of money, they have a, a big debt to build this kind of infrastructure, and they have to think how to be more and more efficient to have a, a system with 30, 35,000 kilometers. Then you have South Korea, that was the second country to open to the competition with Korea from a part, SR from the other part, that are using quite all the same infrastructure, as you know, that are in sort of competition, even if it's not competition on price, that is different from Europe, for example. Then you have Japan, for example, that where there's a private vertical integrated model. So it's completely different. It's a private operator, but it's the infrastructure manager that also is the same owner or is the same company of the railway undertaking and also they develop um, the real estate, for example. Then, we, as we saw, we have a strong investment in Southeast of Asia or in Asia in general, as uh, already told, and there's uh, some investment also in the US, for example, with Amtrak that are buying the new, they bought the new running stock for the Northeast Corridor. This is a little bit a short map what was the situation about the market. What's happening in Europe? Here are some uh, interview that I gave, for example, to Bloomberg or to Reuters, that the fact that we are going, we are going to the competition in Europe for sure, probably also in other countries in the future. It's a little bit like the airline model. I don't know. I teach also at university, also management of transport and the aviation airlines start to have liberalized the market in Europe in 1997 or in US in 1978. If you are in Asia, for sure, you know the liberalization, especially in Asia, with big player that was growing, like AirAsia or Lionair and so on. So are we going the same direction? Probably yes, but we have to understand how we'll be regulated. Something like that. So we have more and more competition, and Italy was a great example, because Italy, we doubled the number of passengers with the same infrastructure. So we have the same infrastructure, but we doubled the passenger, even if the GDP was not growing, so it was a very difficult time, but the number of passengers doubled, thanks to the decrease of the price. And the other element that we have to take in consideration to start the post-COVID uh, operation, how it will be, is that we are not alone in the world. We have a competition of, we have a competition of aviation, especially for the short, medium haul uh, travel. This is the example that I gave uh, to Blom Bloomberg Opinion about the Italian Revolution, how the rail was taken part in the Milan-Rome route. Rome Milan is around 550, less than 600 kilometers. That is similar to Madrid Barcelona, that is 621 kilometers. That could be a little bit similar also to Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, that as we know, the project was a little bit freezing the last years. About the trends of the future, of course, where we where we're going, of course, we have uh, the China that develop the high-speed rail at 400 kilometers per hour. We have a maglev technology, and then we will go a little bit farther on that. We can discuss more in the Q&A. And of course, we have also the Hyperloop that, uh, uh, that was lead thanks to the idea of uh, Elon Musk that uh, was developed in this kind of challenge at global. But we have to understand if that technology could be, in terms of cost, in terms of cost competitive with the high-speed rail that have well, many passengers on the same train until more than 1,000 passengers per train. So COVID-19 impact. First of all, take in mind that the COVID-19 impact is completely different around the world. This is the IMF, the, uh, um, the IMF uh, data uh, that is uh, the International Monitor Fund estimation for the GDP in 2021 versus 2018. So if we take the data of GDP in 2021 uh, in comparison with 2018, of course, it's very interesting that some country will have the same level, like US, plus 0.8% increase 2021 versus 2018. The world will be plus 5.6%, okay? But Euro or Japan, we have a decrease of GDP, minus 2% for the Euro area, minus 1.7% for Japan. But it's completely different for ASEAN 5, okay? Uh, we have also Malaysia, for example, in the ASEAN 5 and so on, but in the Asian, uh, ASEAN countries, we have a plus 12.3%. And in China, we will have a 17.3%, the difference of GDP in 2021 versus 2018. So also when we think about investment, about the economy, that is a very important role we have to take in mind, we will have this kind of data in mind because China and Asian country will continue to grow. So we will expect 
that in that, that country, we can continue to have investment. It's a little bit different in the Euro area, in the Japan area, but that's countries that are very, un, they have very big debt, public debt, that could have some problem in terms of development of infrastructure. So we have to divide the world in two, the Asian country and the rest of the world. Um, the impact on a high-speed rail of COVID uh, was very, very important. I give you some data because normally what we thought, also because they have very strong lobby from the airlines, we thought that the airlines, for example, they have a stronger impact than on the rail sector. But if we compare data, for example, airlines in Europe and the, uh, the main companies, for example, in Italy or in France, the TGV is in France, we can see that the impact, the impact of COVID-19 was stronger on the high-speed rail, on the rail sector, on the high-speed rail. Especially if we think that we are in competition in many routes, as we told, uh, between the airlines and the, the aviation and the rail sector, high-speed rail sector, it's very, very interesting that we had a strong impact, a stronger impact on the high-speed rail than in the aviation sector. This is the data for the last week of March for the supply uh, of, of high-speed trains in the airplanes in Europe in the last week of March, the week of 23rd of March. So this is very interesting to take in mind because uh, if we are not alone in the world, especially high-speed rail, and we have a strong competitor that is the aviation. This is the data about uh, the aviation uh, in, uh, uh, in Asia, uh, especially in China, in terms of domestic international flight. This is uh, from uh, Lufthansa Innovation Hub uh, database that is very inter interesting database. There's analysis that we can see that we have a strong decrease, of course, from the end of January. Uh, the February was a very difficult month. Right now, the aviation in terms of flight, daily flight is going up, especially for domestic flight. It's completely different for international flight, as you know, because there's also some limitation. But if we take in mind that domestic uh, flight is, could be in competi competition with the high-speed rail, we have to think about the same economic and health measure for both airlines and the railways, even if there will be not the same level of competition. So for this reason, we have to pay attention, we have to push our government, I'm trying in Europe, for example, to make understandable that we need the same level of competition, even if high-speed rail will be penalized more than the aviation. This is not, this is not a critics that we have to open whatever. We have to pay attention to the healthy measure, but have to be the same or have to be very similar for the aviation sector and for the rail sector. In terms of high-speed rail COVID impact, in terms of uh, uh, estimation missed revenue in the high-speed rail in terms of billion of US dollar, we have very big, big numbers. In Asia, we are around probably between January and April, 19 billion of US dollar already of missed revenue. In Europe, we are a little bit less also because the sector is smaller, especially because in Asia, we have China, as we saw, that is by far the biggest numbers. As you know, in the USC and the USC data, you can find very good, very, very good data about the high-speed rail sector, uh, about how it was developed in the sector. It's possible to make an estimation, if you know the price of the yield of the company, and it's possible also to know what is the level of decrease of the traffic for every country. So thanks to that, it's possible to make this kind of estimation. And we saw that in Europe, the estimation is 2.5 billion of euro of less of misreading revenues. In Asia, we are 19 billion of US dollar. So it's very, very interesting that it's a strong, very strong impact on the high speed rail. Probably our politicians didn't see them, especially in Europe, but on the rail sector, there's a strong, strong impact and we have to pay attention on that. So I give, when I spoke about competition with the, with, within airlines and high-speed rail, we have to think that uh, we have an asset that uh, could be a train or could be a plane. Take two examples, just two examples. I took the Italo AGV 575 that has a high-speed train, 11 coaches, and it's quite a small train, 462 seats. So it's not a huge train like the TGV doublet, uh, duplex or other kind of train that you can find in Korea or so on. So this is, this is very interesting and uh, this is very important uh, because of course, uh, this is 462 seats. If you take the AirAsia flight or EasyJet, that is the same plane, the A320, the Airbus 320 is 180 seats. So what means when the lower demand start to be an impact due to the COVID? So to have a lower demand, have a, a strongest impact 
on the big train because it's not easy to fill the train with the 500, 600, 1,000 seats at the same time if the demand is lower. So you lose a lot of uh, possibility when the plane is much, much smaller, that is 180 seats. So it's easier for, in terms, if you have a lower demand, to fulfill a, a plane of 180 seats than a train of 1,000 seats. Of course, depending, because uh, as you know, for example, in Spain, the train is a little bit smaller, between 300, 400 seats. And this is, of course, depending on every single country. But in general, the train is much bigger than the short, medium haul plane, that is 180 seats, could be uh, 189 if you take a B737-800, that is a typical Ryanair flight, a Ryanair plane. So this is very important to take in mind. From the part of the demand, as there will be a stronger impact on the high-speed rail than in the aviation sector. This is a, to take in mind, because there's some reports that start to be that it will be easier for the rail than for the aviation. But if we, from the point of view, from the point of view of the, of, of, of the kind of train or the kind of uh, plane that we are using, is much more complex to fulfill a train with 500 or 1,000 seats inside. So uh, there's, uh, the, the other slide is also, we are speaking a lot about social distancing. We'll come, we'll come back to this point later. But social distancing, as you know, is probably will be adopted in many, many transportation. We know, I spoke with many public transport operators that have a big, big problem in terms of uh, social distancing because it's not easy in the peak hour. But also, if we take in mind the social distancing and the seat configuration, it's important to take in mind. If you take a typical AirAsia EasyJet flight, they start to tell that uh, they will have a seat every three, okay, the middle seat that will be without, without passenger. So they can have two thirds or 66% 0.6 of uh, load factor, maximum load factor that will be possible to reach. In the train is a little bit different because if it's possible with one, two configuration, seat configuration to have one, uh, to have 66%, of load factor, normally in the economy class, in the economy class, you have four seats or maybe five seats. So it will be not easy, it will be not easy to have the same configuration. So it will be between 50 and 60% of, uh, of the seat configuration. So this is very important to take in mind because if we will have this kind of social distancing, probably will be stronger on the, uh, the impact in terms of maximum load factor on the, on the rail sector, on the high-speed rail sector, than in the aviation sector. It's quite logical, okay? This is the point. And as I told you before, this is the same graph that I show to Bloomberg opinion, that uh, more and more we are in competition with the aviation, especially for the, the, the distance until 1,000 kilometers. In China, in reality, you can arrive to 1,300 kilometers. So, what is possible to do, for example, is a measure, uh, is a measure that you can have in the country where you have a strong access charge. You know the access charge? The access charge is the cost for using the infrastructure. You don't have in every country, but for example, in Europe, normally it's the first voice of cost, the same in Korea, uh, that is the first voice of cost, 33% of the revenue for Korea, 50% for SR. So this is a very strong voice of cost. Uh, different is in China, or of course is different also in Japan. But in many countries where you have a very uh, strong impact of the access charge, you have to take in mind that uh, could be a measure. So let's start, it's a little bit complex, but let's start from the load factor and the bit margin. Imagine that a rail company can manage the train running with 70% of load factor, okay? You can see here, 70% of load factor. If you take here 70% of load factor, that is normal load factor they can manage, and normally with that 70% of the factor, they can have 15% of EBIT margin, earning before interest and tax margin, imagine that the maximum load factor will be fixed to 50%, okay? So in that case, if they will reduce for legislation from 60% to 50%, that is a maximum load factor, probably they will have a negative EBIT margin. So with the EBIT negative, with the EBIT negative, it's not possible to operate because the company, more the train is running, more the losses is doing. So we have to think something, to do something, if we want to, if we want to make this kind of social distancing on board. The most important things to do is if we go in the load factor from 50% to increase, and we have an access charge cost that is ever 30%, because you pay the access charge normally, it's a little bit different in Spain, but normally it's a little bit, mm, the access charge is paid or is due in function in function of the train that is running okay and this is very interesting because if you for example a cancel 
or you eliminate the offset charge, that is a 30% could be the 30% of the cost, means that you come back at 50%, at the 50% loss factor, you can have an EBIT margin that is a 15% positive. So to reduce the access charge could be a measure, could be a measure to have, to have a, a higher marginality and continuing the train operation. This is very important to take in mind because also the European Union, especially the regulators, are going this direction. There's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting law, uh, there's an interesting letter, sorry, from the European Commission, from the DG from the European Commission that, that uh, uh, start to tell about this kind of possibility for the rail sector. This is very important to take in mind because even if it will be very difficult for operator to operate with the 15% margin negative, we have to take in mind on that. So when we spoke before, let's go back a little bit to the competition between aviation and the rail. I give you some number. Uh, this is a public data that we have from, uh, from the companies. I took the CASC. I don't know if you know the CASC, but it's coming from the aviation sector. The CASC is cost per available seat kilometer. It means how much is the cost for a seat to make one kilometers, okay? Normally in the aviation, you can have from 40 euro or $45 to $70 for low cost airlines, okay? To make 1000 kilometer for one seat. This is very important because it's a cost for available seat kilometer. If we compare normally, if we take Italo, for example, that is a very efficient company, is much lower for the high speed rail, the cask, than in the selection of US and EU low cost carrier in the aviation sector. So normally the rail is much more competitive than the aviation, also because they use bigger train that you have more people on board and the cask is lower. So this is a very important point to take in mind. So what could be happen if the social distancing will have a different impact on the aviation and in the rail sector, as I told you before. So here, if you take, for example, Italo, and we saw, see the cask, we will see that the cask will be higher, okay? They will increase the cost due to this, 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 this measure. So if the cask will be higher, but in the aviation sector, there will be an increase, but will be not exactly the same, but it will be lower increase. Finally, the high speed rail sector will lose competitivity against the aviation sector. And if we are competing for a similar market for the short, short, medium haul distance, maybe between 400 kilometers to 1000 kilometers, of course, that could be a little bit difficult for the rail sector, because we will start to have a not a fair competition between the two sectors. So what is very important for the health measure, for the economic measure that has to be taken for the transportation sector in general, that have to be very similar. If it will be different, of course, we will start to have many more problems in the rail sector than in the aviation sector. We have to pay attention on that, especially our government. I already alerted our government in Italy, so I hope that our government will take the decision to go to the reduction of some cost in terms of, uh, in terms of access charge in Italy, but we will see what will happen. And also in Europe, you know that there's also some interesting proposal from Orail uh, that uh, they, in a, that is a European association that gave some idea in terms of what to do, what to do for government to help the rail sector similarly, similarly to the aviation sector. This is a little bit the map of the cost and the length of the average trip, as you can see, and it's very important to take in mind what I told. So this is a little bit what we saw. So there's some, uh, when we spoke about intermodality competition, of course, normally the rail, the high-speed rail especially, is able to compete between 150 kilometers, around 120 kilometers, to more than 1,000 kilometers. We have example, think about the Beijing-Tianjin, Beijing uh, that is 120 kilometers, that uh, it was a very important line, especially for China, to Beijing, Shanghai, that is more than 1,300 kilometers. So we saw that the rail, the high-speed rail, could be very competitive against the cars and against the aviation. What's happened? We, uh, we think that uh, if there will be no uh, problem for the high-speed rail and we will pay attention to put the same measure in the rail and the aviation, we can expand... Oh, sorry. Okay, we will expand 
Okay, I hope that you can see right now. Uh, we can see that uh, we can think to expand the rail sector to more than 1,000 kilometers that normally is done. Of course, we have to pay attention to what I told you before about the competition, the fair condition between the air and the rail. There's another element. Uh, we, know, we know that the cars, so the automotive, will take more part, more part of the market, especially for shorter distance, because the people will prefer, will prefer to travel by car. This is quite logic, quite a logic element that we have to take in consideration. It's true for the uh, urban mobility that we already saw some example, and uh, is also true for the rail. So if I have to go from Milan to Rhin, that is 140 kilometers, and I'm worried to take the train because it's, I will stay in contact with other people, probably I will take my car that is a one hour and a half, two hours by car against 45 minutes by train, but I will use my car because I feel myself more safe. So what is very important in this case is that the rail will be able to communicate that is very safe to travel by train. And then we will see which measure will be taken or already taken to go in this direction. So when I spoke about competition between rail and, the, and aviation, I start to speak, I have to start to speak about the economic measure. In the rail, in the rail sector, we saw very, very limited intervention of the state in terms of reduction of some cost or reduction of some taxation. So if we check, for example, direct financial contribution, in the rail is very limited as of right now. While in the aviation, we have a lot of examples, I will show you later. So here, for example, we start to see an example from Amtrak, so from US, that the government start to give some support. And also in Austria, they grant temporary PSO to OBB and Westbank, so the, to the competitor and to the main operator that is OBB for Vienna Salzburg routes. This is very interesting, but it's very limited right now. The aviation is very wide. Decrease of access charge or air traffic fee, not yet in the rail, even if more a lot of uh, rail company are asking to their government all around the world. And in the aviation, it's true that it's already happened. So remember what I told you before about the data. Remember that the impact on the high-speed rail was stronger than in the aviation. Remember the data about the Italian high-speed rail, France high-speed rail, and the European aviation market. It was stronger in the aviation, but in the aviation is already taken this kind of things. In terms of decreased elimination of VAT uh, and uh, other taxes in the aviation is limited, in the rail still is not applied. And guarantee loans is very limited, for example, to Amtrak right now uh, for, for, for the rail, while in the aviation is very wide use of that. So how is possible to think about fair level play field between all transport modes with this kind of economic measure by our government? We have to start to communicate to our government that a part of the market is the same and we have to pay attention to these kind of things even if the rail market will be out if they want to kill the rail transport that is more sustainable is not going that they have not to go in this direction this is very important this is a little bit of uh, some press release that i made it uh, <coughs> sorry that i made it uh, about the air transport intervention uh, you can see from italy that is my country as you know uh, here that's my interview about uh, on Reut uh, reuters uh, that I criticized the government that put 500 million just for one airlines. Then you have Hong Kong offers fee relief, Australian government, Singapore. Uh, you can have uh, in Germany with TUI with some uh, uh, guarantee loan. You have Norwegian Air uh, that uh, received money but is not enough, as you can see from this morning news. And then China in March or March start to launch funding scheme uh, for, the, for the service flying through, through the country. And then you have also Korea that are thinking to make something. So as you can see in the rail, in the aviation, is something that it was very used, the intervention of the state to try to help in this strange situation, a very critical situation. I don't want to criticize this kind of intervention. What I criticize that in the rail sector, we need the same kind of intervention if we think that uh, it's in the same market. So I want to, um, finish or quite finish. I have a few slides right now uh, and then I will go to the Q&A that I start to see some questions. That's uh, some health measure that was already taken that could be taken all around the world. This is an example from China but uh, you know China is a sort of phase two already so the post-COVID is already there because they have tried to control. Uh, we have other example from South Korea that is going very well in terms of management. Of course Europe right now is not the best example in terms of management but we have to take the best example 
or the most important example to try to applicate where it's possible to do something similar also in our country, okay? This is a very important point, the health measure for the phase two. So first of all, you have to think about epidemic prevention. You have to control your passenger. That is very easy to tell, not easy to do, because if the station is open, like in Europe, that is an open station or the sort that you have not too much control to enter, of course, to have a passenger control is very, very difficult. The same for temperature taking. You have to create in the station, you have to create in the station this kind of element that before was not there. In China it was more possible because the station, the high speed rail station was similar, already similar to the airport or was similar to the airport, but of course in Europe it was not similar. Of course, more use of, uh, here is not written, but uh, the use of uh, book, self booking tour that uh, it was quite easy because for example, a, a company like Italo already made more than 80% of the web and the app sales online. That is quite logical. Of course, in other countries like China was not so, uh, not so developed these kind of things, but because you have to go before to the station to take your ticket, even if it's changed in the last, in the last month. But of course you have to go in this direction. Then of course you have enhanced ventilation. That is a very important point to take in mind. Uh, especially in the in the coach in the in the coach of the train, but also in the lounge of the station, temperature taking as it all, passenger self protection. Think about the mask and so on, and the trains and the station disinfection. There's some protocol that already start to be discussed. For example, a UIC UIC level, they start to create some protocol, some guidelines that is very interesting to go in this. Uh, this, uh, and this, uh, and this, this point, and then social distancing on board, as I told you before, would be an element, but has to be similar to the aviation model, even if there will be unfair competition between the two transport modes. The emergency response is the other elements that we have to take in mind, because we have, strength, we have to have strength management of suspect patients, because it means that right now, especially in Europe, there's not this kind of uh, management of suspect patients. Still here in Italy, there's uh, 400 people dying every, every day, the same in Spain. So the situation also when there will be the phase two for the high-speed rail transport, we have to be very able to manage this kind of suspect action. Even if we will continue to have this kind of uh, epidemic uh, uh, emergency and we will never solve until the vaccine. Epidemic investigation for the staff, of course, it's very important to do something like that. And passengers with fever, they have to be isolated in the train could happen, something like that. So you can take also the temperature taking on board sometimes, like a sample or something like that. But of course, all these kind of measures, they have a cost. We remember about that. Staff protection is another important element or another key element to take in mind. And the staff protection is mask and gloves, of course, temperature taking also for them. Uh, cruise seat optimization, what means that? That probably you have to also to have the similar group for the shift of the crew that have to be going together to limit the contact with other crew. Uh, with other crew. This is possible to do, it's quite easy. And uh, this is a very important element, okay. Sorry, I received some chat, but it's better to do in the Q&A that I will answer later. And then also you have a separate dining, for example, for the staff, depending how it's managed these kind of things, depending on the country. In the headquarter, you have to have meeting reduction, but also for the staff or the crew that normally they have uh, like, uh, um, a meeting before starting the operation. Maybe you can avoid this or to try to change how to do that and enforce of your duty ma management. So about, uh, sorry, about the risk map, about the first emerge, um, about the health measure, some health measure, about the passenger control, I call that risk map in terms of competitivity cost and Mr. Revenue. So the passenger control, uh, especially for the country where there, was already, there were, were not, of course, this kind of passenger control, it's for sure a cost because you have to put in the station some element uh, or some technology to control the passenger. Also, in terms of competitivity, you lose time to enter in the station. Right now, one of the elements in Europe that you can gain time to enter directly to the station, to go directly to the train or very quickly to the train. You have some control like in Spain or for Eurostar or something like that, but of course it's some element that have to take in mind. Miss revenue, of course, if you lose competitivity, you also also use some, uh, possibly you can lose some revenue due to the fact that the passenger are losing time so they don't want to travel as before. 
passenger self protection if it's given directly by the rail operators is a cost for the rail operators in some cases we start to see we start to see that is given directly is given directly by the uh, by the state or by the uh, police like in spain or something like that temperature taking of course means time means that you lose a little bit of the uh, competitivity but at the same time you think if the people are feel safe on board is much better than to have this kind of, uh, of problem uh, of uh, losing some minutes, uh, one minute or 30 seconds, or maybe a little bit more if there's a queue for temperature taking. Of course, it's a cost. Who will sustain this kind of cost? And as ventilation could be a cost, but of course, could be better for the, for the people if you communicate very well to the people that you have enhanced ventilation on board of the train because of this as, as, a, as a health measure, this is very important. Train station disinfection is very important. You can lose competitivity because you can lose a little bit of productivity of your train if you have to make a disinfection every every service. Of course, it's different if you do in the morning, in the night. But of course, if you make continuously, you will lose a little bit of productivity of your train because your train will run late less and so will make less kilometers per day than the other train. Or of course, you have to take in consideration. Of course, it's a cost. Just our distance on board. This is very risky uh, in terms of risk, of course, could be chosen by the government, but it's missed revenue, is a cost, uh, of course, uh, this kind of uh, thing, and also you lose competitivity, as I told you before. The last slide, and then I will pass to the uh, Q&A. Uh, this is very, very important because uh, we can also take some example from the aviation. Here, there's an example from Emirates, one of the biggest company, they start a few days ago, um, they start to have the first line to conduct on-site rapid COVID-19 test for passengers. It's a blood test, uh, test for COVID-19. It's made by du Dubai Health Authority. So we have to take in mind who will cover the cost. Of course, it's done inside the airports, already inside the airports. Of course, you lose five minutes. Of course, you have to manage something like that. One thing is right now, as right now, there's then quite no traffic. Another thing, if you start to have millions of passengers, this is completely different, but we have to start to think how we can feel more safe our passenger. This is very key element for the phase two and the phase three, we can call that phase three. That is until when we will not have the vaccine that will help the sector to, uh, to go in this direction. So this is very important. Try to think about that we have to have the similar measure in the aviation in the rail sector. Uh, High-speed rail could be impacted more than the aviation sector is a risk. We have to think that the COVID-19 is not uh, the same impact, economic impact in every country. So in terms of investment, we can think that in Asian country and in Asia in general, we can continue the investment on that. In Europe, there's some country that have some problem in terms of budget of the state, that we can have some problem in continuing some big investment. This is an important element to all this kind of element is to be taken for the future. And of course, as I, call, as I told you at the, 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 the end of my presentation, the health measure that I, I has to be very important to be taken in consideration to feel safe, more safe, our passenger on board of our train. So thank you very much for your attention. Here you have my contact, you have my email. Uh, of course, the presentation will be, will be, um, will be um, uh, given uh, if you want. Uh, there will be also the registration, so you can use uh, the registration directly on the Asia Pacific uh, Rail uh, webinar, and uh, for sure, then Bastian will will share about that. And right now, I go directly to the Q and A. I saw, okay, I saw the first question. I go here to Marc Guigon, uh, that is also a great director for passenger. Um, for passenger of UIC that give a very good, very, very, very great presentation last week uh, here. So you can go to watch this interview uh, to, together with the chairman of uh, Light Manila Rail, Rail Corporation. So do you think that COVID-19 increases will have a continuous positive long-term impact on high speed trains against air industry? Um, so if in the short terms, we will be able to take similar measure similar measure in the aviation in the rail and we will go in the same together so i don't want to tell that the aviation or the rail have to be more f have more favor than the other one to go in the same level play field this is very important i think that the rail as i showed you before is very very competitive also in terms of cost this is very important to take in mind 
you can continue to have a lot of passengers on board of the train to transport big numbers of passengers. This is the very strength of the train in very small place, 200 or 400 meters of train. And the rail, high-speed train, could be very, very competitive on that in terms of cost. This is a key element because for the long term, of course, when we will have, uh, when we will have uh, the, the, after the, this crisis, uh, we, can have, we can have a very important impact because the rail can continue to be very, very competitive. We saw with the example of Italy, since when we have uh, the high-speed rail between Milan and Rome, and since when we have also competition on that, right now quite 80% of the market is for the rail. Imagine the similar things uh, between uh, KL and Singapore. Okay, this is a typical example because I came many times to the former SPAD uh, in KL or in Singapore to discuss about that. Okay, this is a very important element. So yes, Mark, I think that the high-speed train could be very, very uh, competitive. So in the long term, in the long term, if we will have the same condition, this is the important element that we have to underline to our governments. If we will have the similar condition, we will go. Uh, we we will be very competitive on that. So the second question is from Toby Kudberson. Thank you very much. How does high-speed rail face up to potential reduction in long-distance business travel as clients get used and choose Zoom, Skype, video conference, like now? This will hurt rail and air. Do we need to refocus on leisure or do you think business will come back? So uh, I didn't tell you before, but I'm also uh, a member of the board of Global Business Travel Association for Italy. Uh, in the board, the Italian board, uh, because I, I, I work a lot in the tourism sector too with many, many, many big players. So this is a very big question because right now, as you know, the total travel industry, business travel industry is uh, 1.5 trillion, was 1.5 trillion dollars. And this year probably we will have 500 billion, so one third, or maybe 700 billion, we will not sure. Of course, we will see, or we are seeing, that uh, the Zoom and Skype conference could be a good substitute. We have good work very, very well on that. But I continue to think that after COVID, after that we will find a vaccine, uh, we will continue to need to have contact. I give an example. For sure, I can continue to give my lecture to my student uh, in California. I will give tomorrow night to my student in Los Angeles, my lecture at university, to uh, University of South California. But it's not exactly the same. The contact between humans is still very, very important and make the, could make the difference on that. And this is a very important element to think that after the, that we will find the COVID, so we will come back in the normal situation, I think that people will continue to travel. Of course, it has a very strong impact for this month, for the next year, uh, 2021, I'm sure that will be affected too. But of course, I think, I think that we will continue to meet the people and to meeting the people it's very, very important for our business. I, I'm traveling all around the world. I will not change as a businessman these kind of things. Uh, still, Mark, um, Mark Igon, uh, decrease access charges a solution to have a better efficiency on high-speed train if the occupancy rate is limited 50%, but we will pay for the infrastructure. Exactly, Mark. This is the key point. Of course, if we reduce the access charge, what is, has to be done, as we saw for the aviation sector, is the government that start to intervene to pay that part that is not paid by the rail operator. So if you have a reduction, you can subsidize, subsidize, you con to have, give a contribution for the limited time to help that. We saw already in the fee reduction, for example, for air navigation in many countries, from Australia to Hong Kong and so on, where they're going this direction, the state, the state are paying for a limited period that part of uh, Access charge that we can call access charge for the aviation that is a little bit different, but is important. But of course, it's very important that as to be clear that the government has to intervene to reduce the access charge, but to pay for the infrastructure manager. Even if the infrastructure manager will start to have big losses and they will not make maintenance and they will not make investments for the future of the race. So this is very very important. So thank you very much for your for your question because it's, it's very 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 important. Uh, if the the rate uh, occupancy is limited to 50%. Of course, depending what kind of system you have. Because in many countries, you pay the access charge, depending on the country, of course. Uh, you pay the access charge because your train is running. So you pay, for example, in Italy, is around 8 euro per train kilometers. 
in Spain is between 14, 16 euro per train kilometers. Of course, there's also change in function of the of the of, uh, of, um, of the passenger uh, of the seat offer. But of course, normally is paid by the train operators in function that they run the train. So in that case, uh, you can reduce the cost for running the train, and that could help the operator to make more train to help the demand to come back. It's a very similar what we can see in the aviation sector that is already done. But uh, thank you very much for your question because uh, it's uh, it's uh, very very important. Um, uh, to better prepare for the end of our lockdown, um, MTA would like to understand experience and our plans of railways who have already responded in economic reopening, as well those key railways uh, who are planning for a reopening aftermath of the lockdown. Thank you very much. Will you make allowance for or require social distancing on train and is the station? How much of returning customer traffic and in what time frame are you expecting? <laughs> so, of course, depending really about the sector, uh, what kind of rail, if you speak about high speed rail, is different if you speak about uh, commuter rail. Uh, I think that uh, on that point, with the USC, we are working a lot on that, on that, on that point. But of course, I'm speaking a lot with the urban operator too, because I, I'm working since many years also with the commuter rail or, or public transport operator. What is very important is about the customer traffic. It's really, it's really linked to the epidemic. So what I'm doing, for example, is some modeling with the best epidemiologists in the world to understand how we can develop the epidemic to give different scenarios also for the government. So it's not working as economists, alone to imagine 30 percent of pre lockdown 50 percent or 80 percent in a year of course we have to take in mind more this kind of um, uh, more of this kind of elements have to be taken in mind social distancing and training in the station we are ready you know that they're ready uh, sum up to help the flow in the station and the flow in the train that uh, start to be used in china or in other country to um, have a better a better use of the space because the space will be very expensive uh, because if you have to maintain social distancing, the space will be very costly. So how to use that technology to, to, to make something like that? So it's important to work with the, with the IT people on that to try to help the government to take also this kind of measure. In terms of uh, uh, and, um, customer traffic and so on, sorry, I was checking the time, uh, it's very important to make different scenario, but more or less more or less depending really how was the, the epidemic in that country for example i know very well the milan case that was one of the worst i can imagine in new york i was bad or also madrid that was very effective that could be very different from other city imagine berlin or other kind of city so we have to make a modeling that is a very very specific for every single region because even if it will be not easy to work or to give data on that. Uh, uh, okay, Mark, thank you very much. Ajay Singh, will, uh, will there be some additional skill to be developing for hand in the post-COVID situation? Of course, there's a, a additional skill, of course, you know, in 40 minutes, in 40 minutes, you can, you can do, or uh, you can speak about all, all the kind of things. What, I'm working with a lot of company on, the, on, that, uh, on that elements of, uh, what kind of things could be developed. First of all, what I suggest to every, every companies is to work a lot in terms of benchmarking because we have a good experience from all over the world. Probably Asia uh, answered better than other country, for example, Europe or US uh, in terms of uh, epidemic. And also in terms of transportation, maybe we can copy, not copy and paste, because it's not possible to paste exactly. As I told you, the access charge measure couldn't be taken in China, uh, for example, or in Japan. But there's some elements that we have to take in consideration. And there's some elements that, of course, uh, we can have, um, we can have, um, we can have, uh, of course, to be taken in mind in terms of uh, uh, some good experience. So yes, we can do. Uh, I'm working a lot on that with uh, many, many companies. But is is very important. This is very important to try to uh, find the best uh, the best um, the best practice all around the world. I think that UIC are go are going uh, with the task force for COVID nineteen are doing a very great job because they are making a, a lot of recollection of data. They are making a lot of uh, working together questionnaire and so on to try to share 
this kind of knowledge. And I think this is the role of UIC that is done very well. So, uh, okay, uh, what, Michelle, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, what action you have seen operator taken for their own stock or regain passenger confidence to stay on train for hours of traveling? Yeah, uh, of, co of course, this is, this is a very, very important measure. So, uh, enhanced ventilation, of course. Uh, take in mind about uh, preventive, uh, um, like uh, hand sanitizer, for example, or to communicate also very well to your, your passengers that that kind of measure has been taken for you, for your health. This is a very important element because many times in the rail industry, there's not good communication with the customer. In this case, is key element that we are working to make their, your travel very safe. And this is very, very important because you can take, as I told you, um, uh, special, special filter and so on. I think that is very, very important to communicate that this kind of measure has been taken for your health. So also if you have some cost in terms, you have to wait for temperature control, don't worry, it's for your health. This is, this is very important, the communication, and is the communication together, the infrastructure manager, the railway undertaking, uh, the authorities, uh, as I told you, the Emirates case is finally done by the authority, the health authority of, uh, of Dubai, that was working with Emirates, because Emirates is by far the biggest uh, player there. It's a quite monopolistic in Dubai, in Dubai airport. So this is very, very important. Um, so yes, yes, we, we have to go in this direction. Also communication, not only technology for that. So also technology could be helped a lot. For example, uh, for the commuter rail, you can know how many passengers you have on board every single coach. So you can alert the people to go, you can go in this coach or not, uh, wait outside the station and so on. But of course, have many costs, have many costs for the future. But it's different from the high speed rail. And uh, yes, Mark, uh, the, yeah, there's a UAC guidance for railway stakeholders online as a, the website. I think it is very, very important on that, that there will be other documents that will be will be go out from USC. So thank you very much. It's important to know about that because USC is great, is doing very great job on that. Uh, from your opinion, three, okay. From your opinion, does demand projection for speed under planning will have to be relooked post COVID? Okay, uh, this is a very, very, very interesting uh, question because uh, as I told you, probably uh, in the short, medium terms, you will have a strong impact. So depending on which kind of infrastructure you are doing, uh, and when is uh, expected to finish this infrastructure? Think about uh, the um, Jakarta Bandung, okay? That has to be finished and probably will be finished uh, this year, next year. Uh, so, probably next year, right now. So, probably in 2021, the beginning of 2021, in 2021, the situation will be not exactly safe or completely safe. I hope so, but uh, we, we don't know yet. So, how to do that? We have to relook, we have to relook the demand, uh, the demand projection. Uh, especially for the short medium for the long of course the i think as i told to mark before uh, in the mark question when answer to the mark question uh, we have i think that the, the rail could be very competitive so we have also to think how to make more and more competitive the rail okay how to make competitive more and more the rail think about uh, the indian new high speed rail or indonesian high speed rail how to make very competitive against the aviation against other kind of transport this is a very important point. So we have to rethink our demand product projection for sure. But at the same time for the long period, also I think that we can, if we will be very able to be very competitive, we'll be able to give very good answer to our customer and to be more competitive than the aviation. So I'm sure that the rail is very, very competitive on that. But of course we have to change a little bit the projection for the high speed rail for the next probably three years at least three years, what I imagine. When I speak also with the, as a GBTA, as a Global Business Travel Association, with many, many players, you know, in that uh, association, there's so many people work in the sector, probably for the next three years, there will be an impact. But after, I think that the rail could be much, much stronger. But it's important to go in the same direction with aviation. Um, okay, I, I hope that I will not miss, uh, uh, the, there's other question I have, uh, I think five minutes more. Okay, I will try to answer to all the question. Um, thank you for sharing and thanks for the, uh, at the time of COVID-19 outbreak globally, companies together with the industry and associated industry, they 
they are relied on a, or having an influence on um, have been thrown into a state of cohesion of uh, uncertainty. It is good or uh, is still connected with her. Yeah, I agree, I agree. It's very important also uh, is really to share the experience in this moment because of course there's many confusion from the aviation sector, from the rail sector, from the public transport sector. It's very important to share our experience, to share the best practice, to think to the phase two. Okay, in some countries we are already in the phase two, but uh, for example, in Europe, still not in many countries. So how we can resume the service, how can we make very competitive the high-speed rail and so on, this is very important. So this virtual connection is very, very important. But I continue to think that then we will continue to travel, as I told before, to have a, not only virtual meeting, because you have also to continue to handshake, maybe not uh, so, so far, uh, but maybe some, uh, some, uh, some other kind of things, but it's very, very important for the business. Uh, thank you, Alvaro. Um, Mark uh, Loder. Okay, Mark. Uh, what do you see as, um, as the consideration and lesson to learn high speed rail currently under construction, such as uh, Rail Baltica? Yeah, thank you. Mark Loder is a director, uh, is a managing director for Rail Baltica. That is a very, very important project uh, for the Eastern country, for the three Eastern countries, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Latvia. That, uh, that is a very important corridor for Europe. So, High-speed rail under construction, like Rail Baltica, uh, is very important to see the forecast of traffic. So we have to probably to see a little bit the projection of the traffic. But at the same time, personally, as you know, because with Mark we met many times, it's also important to think how to increase or how to use at the best the infrastructure. The infrastructure is big cost. And then you have to maximize the use. As you saw in Europe, we are going for the open access competition. In Europe, with the same infrastructure, we have uh, we double the traffic. That was good. You can be able also to attract private investment. That is also good. This is very important to to take in mind. What you needed is also good regulation because, of course, if you don't have a good regulation, finally, it's not easy. So you have to have a good infrastructure and ensure that you are doing very well there. And um, you need a good regulation, and then you need to be able to attract attract investment and to show to the government that it's possible to make rail differently as we think in the past. That means that we continue to have a very big player, very important player, but also the big player are changing. We are seeing that they are changing. They are continuing new, new idea, new business model. We saw in Spain, in France, whatever, but it's needed to go in this direction to be able also in the Rail Baltica, but in other projects, to, uh, to have the maximum ben ben benefits for the passenger and also for who are building the infrastructure. So thank you for your question, Mark. Uh, is, there, um, is there a change in habits how to the trend passenger of using high-speed rail train, whether at night also operate, how trend in the air transport? Um, okay, about the, 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 the trend of the habits, of course it's, it's changing right now. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the night operation in terms, um, depend really is, Normally, is the demand demand is driven, okay? Demand driven. So normally, uh, is market driven. So what you what you needed is that you have to to have a, enough traffic. Uh, uh, probably in the night, no, no, it's very difficult. It's not so easy to have uh, good uh, good traffic on that. Uh, what we saw that we we continue to have quite the same trend in these kind of things, but the trend is completely changed in terms of. Uh, how many passengers and so on. So the, the forecast for the passenger, also for the next month. I, I was speaking with many, uh, with all the CEOs or managing director of uh, airlines uh, in Italy or in Europe. And of course the trend will be changed for the next, at least eight, 18 months of the habits of the consumer. I'm speaking also with airports. And so not only with the rail sector. What is needed is really that we will be able to communicate to our passengers that it's safe to travel. But we have to take all the measures that I showed before that is possible to be taken to be to be able to be able to to give this safety uh, safety uh, to our passenger. This is a key element for the demand for the next month. I think the passenger has to be uh, safe. It has to be very very think that uh, on board is possible to travel without any problem. This is very important to communicate. So I think that uh, this is a very important point to be to be taken. Um, Okay, I think that I finished the time. I saw, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. 
I will try to answer if you have any other question. I know that um, I will try, I will try, I will try to answer also personally. So thank you very much and I give back the, 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 the word to Bastian. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you so much for your presentation and your, your insights uh, in the high-speed rail industry recovering from COVID-19. Um, if there's any questions that were unanswered, please feel free to uh, reach out to Andrea directly. Um, the slides can be found through the on-demand video. Uh, the link will be sent to your email uh, in the coming days. Um, and with that, we would also like to share our um, next week's session uh, given by Krish Mutusami. Uh, he will be speaking on customer experience in COVID-19. So uh, please make sure to tune in uh, for that session as well. Um, thank you all for watching and uh, please stay safe. Hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.